Happy Boxing Day. I'm Daniel Whittington, the Chancellor at Wizard Academy and Whiskey Marketing School. Um, I used to use songs to read the room. Now, uh, and I've discovered that that same habit and that same approach I pretty much do in everything that I create. So what I mean is when I first started um, doing, you know, shows where I was playing like a restaurant or a coffee shop or something where I was a technically background music, and the crowd wasn't really there to hear me, like I wasn't the featured artist or anything, I was just a guy playing songs in the corner. And when you're in that situation, it's really hard to tell whether or not what you're doing is, is landing because everyone's living their own lives, doing their own things. And in a normal rock show, or any show, when people come to see you, they're all intent, and it's very easy to get connected and to figure out, like, is this working? Are, are we landing? But when, everyone, when your goal is to sort of, like, provide accompaniment to people's lives, and you still want to impact them, but not, you know, dominate, uh, that's a different thing. And so what I realized is that I would start my sets with, you know, 10 different totally different songs, uh, all covers, no originals, or maybe one original. Like a Coldplay, and then like Bob Dylan, and then maybe a U2 song, and then, you know, maybe a weird cover of an 80s rock, but on acoustic guitar, uh, so like Minute Work or something. And as I would play all these totally different songs, I would watch the room to see who interrupted their conversation to either look over and kind of nod, or who, while having their conversation, just started moving to the music or like mouthing the words. And as I marked that person, I'd remember what song that was, and I would just work my way through my, my 10 songs until I had figured out who's in this room and which of the songs that I played captured the most people, and then I would change the whole rest of my set list based on that. And I always got more tips than Anybody who ever played those gigs, uh, people at restaurant managers would comment on it. Man, you make, other people make like $30 a night in tips and you make like six, $700 a night in tips. It's like, yeah, I know because I'm paying attention to people <laughs> and I'm, I'm seeing what marks those things. So I've discovered that I do that with several other things. And anytime I'm creating something, if I'm standing in a space and I'm watching it land, I'm really good at reading this space and reading the people. But if I'm in, for some reason, separated in any way by a direct one-to-one -one focused audience, what I tend to do is just scatter shot and hit the boundaries. Just try to push up against every possible boundary until I figure out where the edges are, and then I start making decisions about the path forward. And I do that with blending whiskey. <laughs> exactly the same as I did it with music, and I'm doing it right now with the future of this channel. So, first let's talk about the whiskey, which we have thanks to the super generous and kind human being Patty Bennington. Because I'm no longer financially involved directly with Crowded Barrel Whiskey, uh, I can very easily talk about Crowded Barrel Whiskey. And so, finally, I'm gonna talk about the last blend that I did at Crowded Barrel before I stepped aside and Irene Tan took over blending for Crowded Barrel and they're in good hands. Irene Tan is brilliant. But this is Hydra and it's part of the, uh, the uh, Magnificent Beast series of blends and um, the label is beautiful. Um, but this, what we did was, my, the last one was um, Jackalope and it won awards uh, it got a gold medal in, in, uh, from Beverage Institute and a silver medal in New York and um, I think a bronze in San Francisco. And uh, when we finished that blend, I'm really proud of it. I'm still really proud of that one. What I wanted to do for the second blend was a smoky version of that blend. That wasn't exactly the same, but it was in that family. Like you could recognize it as a relative. And what we had was after I'd blended Jackalope, I still had enough left of three Balconis barrels that we dumped all the remains of those three barrels back into one barrel and let it keep aging. So we had this one barrel that was a blend of three Balconis barrels, and I used that as the base for this whiskey. So it makes up 53% of the blend. And then I wanted to make it peated, and I wanted to use our 
a crowded barrel Baird's peated malt that we had done because we were looking for something to do it with, but it was so punchy. And so I thought maybe it'll rest inside of this Balconis. And so I put that in and it ended up at 26%, two-year-old Baird's single mom from Crowded Barrel. And then the light whiskey sort of kind of softened the edges of all of this up. And that was in at 16%. And then there was something missing. Now, here's how I blend. And there's everybody you talk to who blends has a different pet system. But the way that I blend is I tend to work on a basic pyramid theory, which is I have an idea of a base, I have a secondary whiskey that's gonna be a rounder, and I have a third that's gonna be the spice and accent. And it doesn't have to equal exactly three whiskeys. I just think in terms of flavor profiles, I look for a base, a mid-rounder palette, and a sparkle treble, for lack of a better. And so when I'm first starting, if I only have a few ingredients and they all live in certain families, I first find what they all are, and then I create like two dozen different variations of base, mid, light in a triangle shape, big, smaller amount, smaller amount, right? And I do that with all the different whiskeys as the base and all the different whiskeys as the mids and all the different flavor, pro flavor profiles as the, it's a lot of variation. And then I let those sit. So that's just me throwing everything out there. And then I go back and I figure out where it landed and why I think, and I narrow it down. And then I start playing with those proportions and mixing them. And with this one, I had originally started with a light whiskey as the base, and I did one blend with the Balconis as the base, and that one came out ahead. Uh, and the same thing was with Jackalope. But that sort of same kind of like throwing it to see what sticks landed. But something was missing in this one. So I had it down to where there was no question this was the blend, but I wasn't totally happy on every variation I had created. It was missing something in, the, in this sort of like high mid and then we got in these samples from Monotani Distillery, and it was of their uh, malt, whisk, single malt whiskey, and it was only a year and a half old. It was really young, and it looked really, and it smelled kind of young, but it was also really honey and granola, and I thought, holy crap, I think that's what's missing in the blend. So I added a tiny amount, like two milliliters, in this vial of that Monotani one and a half year old, and it tied everything together and it worked. And so that makes this uh, technically a year and a half old whiskey, even though it has 15 year old light whiskey in it <laughs> and, and like three year old Balconis, two year old Crowded Barrel and a year and a half Monotani. Um, but it really just put all the pieces together. So on the nose, you can smell that sort of ashy char. And actually that is coming from the Baird's, that, um, that Baird's Crowded Barrel malt. But there's also a sort of roasted marshmallow note, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, that's coming from the 15-year-old light whiskey, this sort of charred vanilla. And then surrounding all of that is this deep berries and cream kind of richness. And then there's a little thread of that monotony honey. Ah, that's good. It ended up at 57%, and we left it. I, I tried a bunch of proofs. 57% was... Um, where it ended up great. Mmm. <laughs> I forgot how good that is. <laughs> it's been a little bit since I drank it. It goes pure honey granola and then explodes into fruit and while a whole time sort of existing in this like distant threaded haze of smoke and barrel char. Mmm. Mm, and it lingers, and what lingers, and this is why the Monotani fixed it, what lingers is not this ashy char, even though it's smoky. What lingers is that honey and cream with a hint of toasted vanilla. That's a really delicate smoky whiskey. I think I'm really proud of how that ended up. And I will tell you firsthand, Irene Tan, who may, uh, you may have uh, met her, if you don't know the tribe community, or you've never seen her on Vault. But we did an episode, Rex and I, a long time ago where we went to her store and visited her retail store. Uh, and she's a level four whiskey som here at the school. And you're gonna see her on camera probably telling a story here at some point. Uh, but she has an astounding palette and she's gonna be creating some really cool blends. So, I mean, she already creates really cool blends. She's gonna be creating really cool blends, blends for Crowded Barrel. So, let me get back to why are we 
why am I using this example? Because when we started the new channel here, when I tried to come up with what we were gonna do, I needed a solid contrast from what we had been doing. Um, because doing it the way we were, uh, we couldn't move forward that way. And I can't just do a, a mediocre, watered down version of what we were doing before. That's not gonna work either. And so I looked for what is the soul of what we teach at the Whiskey Marketing School and the soul of what I wanna represent from the school. And, the, and the, what that was was human connection and story and making whiskey human, right? And that yes, you want tasting notes and yes, you want information about the whiskey at a certain level, but what's far more important is story and people. And so we've tried a bunch of different things and I wrote the first, you know, I guess it's been like 20 videos now or getting into 20 videos. And what you've seen is me just throw things in every direction. Let's tell a ghost story. Let's talk about the origins of Wizard Academy. Let's talk about third gravitating bodies. Let's tell a story about a, a Scottish whiskey distillery peat shed. Let's, you're watching me just throw things out. And you're watching me feel out your reactions and how it feels and, uh, and whether I can find the thread for like a consistent long-term storyline or whether we're gonna keep this just sort of like a surprise every Tuesday and Thursday on like who knows what you're gonna hear about today. And I can tell you I don't know. I know that the structure is right. This is right. I feel it in my bones. But I think as an artist, you always need to balance staying true to what you believe is valuable and what you have to add to the world and also being of service to your fellow human beings. Not all artists think that way. Uh, a lot of artists I know are just like, no, I will be me, true to my art, ah, damn the odds. And that's fine. I'm not one of those artists. My whole life in music um, and in writing, I've always sort of tried to hold both of those things. One, this is who I am, this is what I'm gonna say, this is what I have to do, I don't care if you like it. And then on the other hand, thank you so much. I wanna be of service, I wanna contribute and I want your life to be improved from your experience with what I've created. And so I'm gonna keep doing that. I think art is improved when you are helping shine a light on the shared human experience and not just your own siloed experience. And I think art is powerful to a larger group of people when a larger group of people can see themselves reflected in what you've created or what you say or what your opinion is. The reason this entire channel exploded I mean, there was a lot of reasons, but one of the, I think one of the core things was that that core tenant that we had, that the definition of good whiskey is whiskey you like the way you like to drink it. And enough people rallied around that general attitude and then how we created it and the energy between Rex and I, that definitely contributed. But the general core soul of that is still alive and uh, it's still something that resonates, I think. And so I hope that this is of value, but I'm gonna keep doing this because this is, um, this is really landing for me. And I hope it's landing for you. And if it's not, that is absolutely okay. <laughs> I have a ton of recommendations I can put in the comments on channels that might be more in line with what you're looking for. But if you stick around and hang out, then you're gonna get a voice in how we grow and what we do next because of, we're always trying to balance those two things. So, thank you for watching. I'm really glad you're here. Cheers.